Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the broadcast today. I'm so delighted that you're able to join us for this time of teaching in the Word of God. I'm Dr. Andy Lane Bunch, the pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. Before we get into the Word of God today, though, as always, we want to remind you of all of the wonderful free resources we have available for you at our website at randylanebunch.org. If you'll look under the media link, you'll find our podcast, our blog, past editions of this broadcast, as well as many other resources as well. While you're there, Go to our YouTube channel and subscribe if you would. It'd be a great blessing to us. The more subscribers we have, the better. And uh, we believe that it'd be a blessing to you. You'll be receiving a notice every time we post something new uh, to the YouTube channel. You can also uh, subscribe to our blog so that every time we write something, sometime, every time we issue a podcast, you'll get a notification of that in your email as well. Uh, also, we would love to hear from you. If you've been blessed by the broadcast, if you've received a healing, if you've been saved, if God has done something in your life through the teaching of the Word of God, or you simply have a prayer request, you'd like to share with us, please email us at info at connectingpc.org. We would love to hear from you. Well, today I believe we have a wonderful blessing for those of you, particularly those of you who have been standing for a long time where it comes to the healing of your body. If you've suffered with, uh, suffered with long-standing sickness, it can be very faith-defeating. But again and again, we see that Jesus brought victory to those who were suffering with long-standing sickness, and that's exactly what we want to talk about today, and that is victory over long-standing illness. So, if you'll turn with us to John chapter 5, we're going to begin with the same story that we began our last broadcast with, talking about the mercy pool. We're going to be talking about the man at the pool of Bethesda. As we said, Bethesda means house of mercy. And this certainly was a manifestation and evidence of the mercy of God as God reached out and touched a man who had been in the same condition for 38 years. So no matter how long you've been sick, friend, I want you to know there's always a reason to have good hope in God. John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. It says, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming down, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. So here we have a wonderful story of Jesus turning the circumstances around of a man who had had an infirmity for 38 years. And as I said, oftentimes long standing sickness can be very faith defeating. It can drain our hope away. It can get us to think, well, this is going to be my lot in life forever. But the very first thing we need to understand from this story, it's very obvious in reading it, friend, that just because circumstances have been a certain way, a negative way, a horrible way in our life for many, many years is no indication that God wants them to remain that way, nor are they an indicator of God's will for you. Oftentimes people get the idea that, well, you know, whatever will be, will be. And if it's the will of God, he'll change it. But if it stays the same, it must be the will of God. But friend, that's not true at all. Our circumstances don't reveal the will of God to us. God's word reveal his will for us. And so we need to understand that it's not our circumstances, but the word that reveal the will of God to us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we need to have faith in the word over our circumstances rather than putting a trust in the way that they've been. And so oftentimes I've heard this uh, be the case sometimes. I've heard someone say something like this. Now this is just a fictional instance, but I've heard things like this many times before. Somebody might say, you know my aunt, she's such a godly woman and she's been sick for so long. If anyone were going to get healed of their illness, it would be my aunt. And what they're trying to say by that is, if it was the will of God, surely my aunt would be healed because she's such a godly woman. And friend, there's no doubt that person's aunt might be a very godly woman. But there are several things wrong with the assumptions that that individual is making in a statement like that. Number one, we have to understand that no one gets healed on the basis of their merits. It doesn't matter how good a Christian you are, nobody earns 
earns any blessing from God. All the blessings of God are made available through Jesus Christ and are given to us by his grace and received through faith. We appropriate them by faith, not on the basis of our merits. Doesn't matter how faithful you've been to Sunday school and church. Doesn't matter how good a giver you've been to your local church. Friend, we're not healed on the basis of our works. We're healed on the basis of the goodness of God and the provision of redemption that God made available to us through Jesus Christ. And the only way we can appropriate the redemptive benefits God's made available to us is through faith. Secondly, we need to understand God doesn't owe anyone anything. Again, we never appropriate the blessings of God on the basis of our merits. It's only through the mercy of God that we receive anything. And as I said, it really comes through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Romans 8.32 says that if God spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? So all things that God gives us come through the redemption that's in Jesus Christ and are appropriated, as we said, by grace through faith. All of our blessings, all of the things God provides for us really are redemptive benefits because apart from Jesus Christ, the only thing we deserved was judgment. So thank God we can appropriate by faith what God has made available through his grace. I know, having heard my spiritual father, Brother Hagen, talk about ministering healing many times, he said that when he would do a meeting, and particularly a healing meeting, he would have the pianist play, Just As I Am. Now, if you're not familiar with that hymn, it's the very hymn that Billy Graham would use whenever he would give an invitation for sinners to be saved at the end of every crusade. And you might remember the old refrain about that hymn. It says, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that thy blood is shed for me. In other words, I'm not coming on the basis of my works or my merit. I'm coming on the basis of the blood. And Brother Hagin would have them play that hymn for several reasons. Number one, to always remind them that the ground is level at the foot of the cross because your pedigree won't get you there. Your social standing won't get you there. Uh, your money or how good a Christian you've been. None of these things commend you to the blessings of God. It's simply by his grace that we come and appropriate what Calvary has made available to us. So just as I am without one plea, I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to say that I merit the blessings of God, but I'm coming on the basis of the goodness of God extended to me through what Jesus Christ did in paying the penalty for my sins and making God's blessings available to me. And he's reminding us that we can all appropriate those blessings by grace through faith. Not only that, but Brother Hagin would play that so that people would be reminded that they don't come and receive these blessings on the basis of how good a Christian you are. I remember him telling a story one time of holding a revival in a particular Pentecostal church, and uh, there was a, a particular person in the town that was a notorious sinner. I mean, the guy was just a, a real rascal, and, and he hadn't been living for God at all. But somehow or another, he heard about the revival, he came, and when God began to deal with his heart, the man became repentant, and he fell across the altar, and he, with all sincerity, repented of his sins and gave his heart to Christ. And God not only saved him, but he filled him with the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues. Not only that, but before the week was out, God healed him, and if I remember the story rightly, I believe the whole family came to God. Well, after the meeting, you think everybody would be happy about that, but after the meeting, uh, one of the long-standing church saints uh, came to my spiritual father and said, I'd like you to tell me something if you would. And she was pretty mad. And he said, well, I will if I can, sister. And she said, well, I want you to tell me why would God heal that uh, horrible old sinner when he didn't even heal me and everybody knows I'm the best Christian in this church. Well, first and foremost, I would have to say that she's probably not nearly as good a Christian as she thinks she is with an attitude like that. But he had to tell her, sister, God doesn't heal us on the basis of how good a Christian we are. He heals us on the basis of his mercy. He heals us on the basis of his grace. And this brother didn't come trying to commend himself to God with what a good Christian he was. He simply threw himself over on the mercy of God and appropriated by faith what God made available through grace. And I heard him uh, say later, he said, I knew God wasn't going to heal this woman because he said, when I came up to her in the prayer line, I heard her say under her breath, Lord, I know you're going to heal me. I'm the best Christian in this church. Well, friend, you may be the best Christian in your church. You may be the most faithful, but God is going to heal you on the basis of your faithfulness or how good a Christian you are. Our works, the Bible says, are as filthy rags. In other words, our works do not commend us to God. Rather, the finished work of Christ commends us to God. And it's through him that we appropriate the blessings of God. Think about it. This man had been in this condition for 38 years. Friend, you know, that's plenty of time for people to tell him, now, brother, you know if it was the will of God for you to be healed, surely within 38 years you would have been healed by now. It's plenty of time for that man to have said by, to himself, 
you know, there must be something wrong with me. I must really be a sinner. God must not like me. I must somehow not qualify for the blessings of God. Uh, maybe all those horrible things people have said about me are true because if I were good enough and if God loved me enough, surely I'd be healed by now. Friend, these are real scenarios. These are things that people tell other folk. These are things people tell themselves sometimes and they undermine their confidence and faith in what God would do for them because they simply don't believe that the will of God is for them to be blessed. But none of those things reveal the will of God. So here's the question. How can we know the will of God? Well, we've already said the word of God is a revelation of his will, first and foremost. But also Jesus is a revelation of the will of God. We see that several times in the scriptures. Let me read you a few verses that attest to the fact that Jesus is the will of God in motion. John 1.18, listen to what it says here. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, or as another translation says, he has revealed him. So in other words, no one's seen God, no one's seen the Father, but Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. And if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. In fact, one time, Philip said to Jesus, one of his disciples, Lord, show us the Father, and it will su be sufficient for us. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long a time, Philip, and you don't know me? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, I'm a walking revelation, a walking, talking revelation of the will of God. And so we have to understand that Jesus is a revelation of the Father. In fact, the Bible said, speaking of Jesus in Hebrews 1.3, that he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of God. God's person. In other words, he's a perfect reflection of the will of God. Listen to some of the things that Jesus said regarding the works that God gave him to do. Uh, let's go ahead and look at uh, John 5, 36. This is what Jesus said about the miracles or the works that he did. He said, but I have a greater witness than John. Remember, John the Baptist bore witness of Jesus and said that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. But he said, I have greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. In other words, Jesus saying, I, I couldn't do these things unless the Father gave them uh, me to do. You see, Jesus was very clear in the fact that he could only do what the Father gave him the ability to do. See, a lot of times people think, well, Jesus was God, and so of course he could heal people. But the Bible's very clear, friend, in, he, in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible said that when Jesus became a man, he emptied himself and became a man as other men. Well, then how did he do the miracles that he did? It doesn't mean that he wasn't God. He was God. But he divested himself of his inherent power and glory that he could identify with you and I and become a man and take our place in death. It's kind of like this. I, I use this example sometimes. If I come into the room and it's warm in the room, I might take my jacket off. Well, I haven't laid aside myself. I've simply laid aside something that I possessed. Likewise, when Jesus became a man, he didn't cease to be God. He is God, was God, and always shall be God. But he laid aside the inherent glory that he had as, as God so that he could identify with you and I. Well, how did he do the miracles that he did? Well, Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So how in the world could he have done the works that he did if the Holy Spirit wasn't empowering him to do it? So what Jesus is saying is these works that the Father has given me to do, they bear witness of me. And then one other, John 14.10, Jesus responding to his disciples said this, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. So it's the Father who did the works and gave Jesus the words that he spoke. In other words, Jesus' ministry was one that was inspired by, empowered by, and led by the Spirit of God. It was the Father in him doing the works. Now, as we said before, Israel had a healing covenant, but obviously they were not walking in the fullness of that covenant because when Jesus comes on the scene, he heals multitudes that are sick. Not only does he heal multitudes that are sick, but we have several instances of individuals that he deals with and ministers healing to them, as well as casting out many devils all throughout his ministry. He's taking authority over every spirit, evil spirits. He's uh, ministering healing to people. And so even though they weren't walking in the fullness of that healing covenant, uh, Jesus revealed that healing covenant was still very well intact as he began to uh, heal the people uh, in his own ministry. 
But I want you to notice in Exodus chapter 15, we're going to read this healing covenant again. Beautiful image of the willingness of God to heal his people. And this is what God said to the people of Israel. Right after they came out of the uh, Egyptian bondage, it says, He said to them, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, friend, that phrase, I am the Lord who heals you, in, in the Hebrew is actually, I am Jehovah Rapha. It's one of God's redemptive names. Jehovah is the redemptive name of God, which means that all the benefits these names reveal find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. Christ. You could say these names foreshadow New Testament blessings that the old covenant people enjoyed on the basis of a promissory note of what Christ would one day provide at Calvary. And one of those redemptive names is Jehovah Rapha. I'm the Lord your healer. I'm the Lord your physician. And so God revealed to them that he was their healer and they had a healing covenant with God. In fact, I want you to notice another instance of long-standing illness where Jesus makes an allusion to this healing covenant covenant. He mentions this healing covenant. Go with me to Luke chapter 13 and we're going to look at a woman healed from a spirit of infirmity. Again, Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 10. It says, Now he was in the synagogue, and uh, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her immediately. She was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord answered and said, hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, notice this phrase, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So here's another instance of long-standing illness. The Bible said this woman had been bound, notice, by the devil, by Satan, for 18 years. This reminds me again of Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were what? Oppressed of the devil. Satan is the oppressor. Jesus is the deliverer. And through the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon his life that God had given him, he broke the yoke of sickness again and again over the lives of people. Now again, here's a woman who's not only been sick for 18 years, she's been going to church. Here she is in the synagogue, and yet Sabbath after Sabbath, she hasn't been healed. And suddenly Jesus steps in, and now she's healed. So see again, friend, you can be going to church. You may be going to the wrong church. You may be going to a church church that doesn't teach healing, that doesn't believe in healing, that says, well, that was for them back then, but it's not for us today. Well, that's not going to inspire faith to be healed. But when Jesus comes on the scene, it doesn't take that long before all of a sudden her circumstances are different. See again, friend, your circumstances, your long-standing illness is not a revelation of God's will for you. I don't care if you've had it for 38 years like the man at the pool of Bethesda or 18 years like this woman bound with the spirit of infirmity. Once Jesus walks into your circumstances and situations, friend, all of a sudden it can instantly be different if you'll just simply believe and reach out by faith and appropriate all that Jehovah Rapha wants to do for you. You know, here's this woman at church and all of a sudden her pastor gets mad that she gets healed. Who would ever think that someone would get mad that one of their church members was healed? But I'm telling you, sometimes people get full of envy. I prayed for her, she didn't get healed and now here comes this upstart uh, itinerant Jewish evangelist and, preach, and, and uh, prays for her and she gets healed and sometimes that kind of thing makes people mad. They have religious rules and, uh, and religious ideas and doctrines and dogmas and they think, well, I believe that's passed away. Well, I don't know what this man believed, but obviously healing was for her because when the will of God showed up, she was healed even though she had been bound by the devil for 18 years. So friend, I don't care how long uh, you've been oppressed. I don't care how long you've been sick. She was a daughter of Abraham, meaning she was a daughter of the covenant. And as such, the blessings of God belong to her. And the good news is, friend, you and I, if we're children of God, we're also heirs of Abraham. Let me read you a great verse in Galatians chapter 3. 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. And here he's talking about Abraham, the man of faith. And this is what Paul says. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? In other words, do you get this stuff by your good works or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. See, Abraham was a man of faith. He didn't count on his merits to get the blessing of God or to be made righteous. He was made righteous with God by his faith. Verse 7 goes on to say, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And the Bible later says in the same book that the blessings of Abraham are ours. They come upon the Gentiles through faith. And so, friend, if you're a, a believer, if you're a, a, a child of God through faith, then you are an heir of believing Abraham. In other words, it's not just the natural seed of Abraham who are his heirs, but the spiritual seed, those who are of faith. The blessings of Abraham are yours. And friend, being a son or daughter of Abraham, you too ought to be loosed from your bond on any day. Not just the Sabbath day, but on any day. God wants you free. God wants you to be made whole. Well, friend, I don't know what your circumstances are today. I don't know how long you've been sick. I know that there have been people who've been sick for many, many years. Years. And you may be saying to yourself, well, you know, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm so glad to hear this is good news for someone, I'm sure, but you don't understand. I, I haven't lived right. I, I, I've been doing some of the wrong things. I, I haven't been living a perfect life. Well, what makes you think these people were living a perfect life? You know, yes, this woman was in the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath day, but friend, you and I both know there's a lot of people who go to church that aren't living right. I grew up watching people live one way uh, when they were about their work week, uh, you know, Monday through Saturday, and then they'd come to church and act another way. I've seen that. You've seen that. We've all been like that at one time or another. We've all played the hypocrite at some time or another, but God still loves us. Well, you don't understand, brother, I've sinned. I've, I've kind of made this pit for myself, and now I've just got to lie in it. Friend, the whole plan of redemption was God digging man out of the pit of his own digging or lifting man out of the pit of his own digging. So don't think that because you've sinned or missed the mark, God won't have mercy on you. God will have mercy on you. In fact, remember in James chapter 5, 14 and 15, the Bible said, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Why? Because the same redemption provided both forgiveness as well as healing. David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. Both healing and forgiveness are part and parcel of the redemption that Christ Jesus purchased for us. So friend, I don't care what made you sick. I don't care if it was decisions you made that landed you in hot water and all of a sudden you somehow opened the door to sickness and disease in yourself. You know, many people are simply sick because of original sin. In other words, they didn't do anything. It's just the fact of the matter that sickness and disease is in the earth because of sin. As John Alexander Dowie said, sickness is the foul offspring of its mother sin and its father Satan. Sickness and disease entered the human experience because of the original sin. But thank God Jesus came and paid the penalty for that sin that we might be judicially released from its power, both spiritually as well as physically in our bodies. Now, if we live on in this mortal body one day, of course we're going to lay it aside in death. And then we're going to receive a tremendous upgrade and receive a body likened to his glorious body that will be immortal in untouchable by death. But until that time, friend, the Bible said that we've been given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as an earnest of our inheritance. And the Bible said in Romans 8, 11, that if the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he that raised Christ from the dead will likewise give life or quicken your mortal body by his spirit who dwells within you, who lives in you. So friend, right now, we're going to pray for you. And I don't care what your circumstance is. I don't care if you've been sick for 38 years. I don't care if you've been paralyzed. I don't care if you've been blind. I don't care if you've been deaf. We're going to pray right now. And just like that man at the Pool of Bethesda, just like that woman with a spirit of infirmity for 38 years, just like others that we'll talk about next week on the broadcast, you can be healed today. Your circumstances can change. I want you to extend your faith with me and let's believe God for a miracle. Let's believe God for his power to raise you up out of that death deathbed, out of that wheelchair, out of your circumstances, whatever they might be. And in addition to that, as we pray and believe, if there's been any sin in your life, if there's been anything between you and God that's inhibited your relationship with him, he'll wash you clean of that as well. I'm going to pray a prayer of faith right now, and I'm going to believe God to do something in your body. But before I do that, 
I want to invite you to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to wash your sins away. Friend, he died to pay the penalty for your sin. He balanced the scales of divine justice on your behalf and mine so that we could have a relationship with God, be reconciled unto him. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, if you've never received what he did for you, uh, to be the answer, to be the salvation of your soul. I want you to pray a very simple prayer with me. I want you to say the words after me, but I want you to mean it with all of your heart. Say this with me, if you will. Say this, Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I believe that you love me. That you died for me. And right now, I accept the free gift of salvation that you offer. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. I receive you now as both Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want to hear from you. Email me at info at connectingpc.org. We want to pray for you. We want to stand with you. We want to believe God with you for your growth in the things of God. But I'm going to do exactly what I said I was going to do. I'm going to pray for you right now. And regardless of your physical condition, I'm going to ask you to extend your faith and believe God. You know, in days gone by, we've seen people that were scheduled for amputation, healed by the power of God, where they didn't have to have that amputation. I've seen barren wombs that were open and people healed. I've seen other terminal conditions. One lady in a meeting in Connecticut, she had um, a lupus, an incurable condition. She was healed. We even had one man in Connecticut uh, that came to our meeting with HIV. And, and the report we got later was a year later we heard that he had been healed of that HIV. They don't come too big for God. Uh, you know, sometimes people speak about things like cancer in hushed and reverent tones. Oh, they have cancer. Friend, I'm telling you, the name of Jesus is above every name, including the name of cancer. And so we're going to pray for you right now and believe God to minister healing to your body. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my friends right now. Father God, I pray right now, while their faith is extended, that you would reach through this camera, right through this television set, right through this computer, right through this screen. I pray that your healing power would touch their bodies right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord, God that all pain would go. I pray for nerves. Father God, nerves that have been feeling pain for years. In fact, maybe there's someone here I sense in my heart that maybe you've had some kind of condition where the nerves don't shut down. They just signal pain all the time. I speak to that condition right now in the name of Jesus. I command you to be whole and healed and for pain to disappear. He bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. Father, I thank you right now for ministering to chronic headaches, migraines, and other such as that. Father, I pray, Father, for people's eyes that they would be restored and made whole. For their hearing, that their ears would be open and they would be made whole. Father God, I sense there's somebody that feels a choking around their throat. I take authority over that in the name of Jesus as well as evil spirits that are influencing the, the bodies of people, bringing sickness and disease. I command those spirits to leave them now in the name of Jesus. We take authority of them. We've been authorized to do so by the head of the church. We take authority over that. We command those uh, sicknesses to depart from those evil spirits to depart. We thank you, Father, for ministering healing to those bodies right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for ministering to barren wombs. May they uh, bring forth life in the name of Jesus. May they be brought forth in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Father, for ministering healing to the crown of their head and the very soles of their feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friend, we're so delighted that you tuned into the broadcast today, but we want to remind you, we have uh, many, many resources available for you on our website. So please go to randylanebunch.org. Go to the media link under that. Like I said, you'll find our magazine. Uh, you'll find our, um, our podcast. You'll find our blog. We have tons, literally hundreds of articles that will be a blessing to you, as well as past editions of this broadcast on our Connecting Point TV page, as well as our YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, and every time we post a new broadcast, you'll get a notification. You can continue to build up your faith and receive from God everything that he has for you in this wonderful plan of redemption. Well, we're going to come back with part two to this message of victory over long-standing sickness next week. Come and join us again. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week on the show. Mm -hmm.